Welcome to the second session of the Bioconference Live for Cancer Research, Discovery, and Therapeutics. My name is Michaeline Bunting, and I will be your moderator for this presentation. On behalf of Life Technologies, I'd like to introduce Dr. Dan Rhodes, the head of Compendia Biosciences Business Unit and Vice President of Medical Science Informatics. Dan will be presenting a bioinformatics approach to sequencing cancer samples. At the end of Dan's presentation, I'll be facilitating Q&A, so feel free to submit questions during his presentation. Dan. Great. Thank you, Michaeline. Uh, it's a real pleasure uh, to be uh, speaking to you today. Uh, we've got an exciting story to tell. Uh, we're going to talk about how really we're merging ion torrent technology with uh, bioinformatics and genomic analysis to identify the important genetic events in cancer and build cancer sequencing solutions to really power the next generation of clinical uh, research. What I'm going to talk to you today uh, is about Life Technologies' goal to ultimately democratize sequencing for cancer. We imagine a world in which uh, cancers are universally sequenced, uh, streamlined informatics allows us to interpret and understand those sequences, and ultimately to link sequences to therapies and clinical trials uh, of, of interest. So the two key questions that we're going to address today are, uh, given the state of next generation sequencing and sequencing in cancer, we're going to try to answer two important questions. What are the genes and the specific regions of genes that we need to measure? What are the most relevant informative genes? And then ultimately, what would we like to report out uh, when a cancer sample is positive for a particular genetic alteration? So two simple questions, but important ones. And we're going to talk about our bioinformatics strategy to really leverage all of the world's content, all of the information that's available to us in the public domain to answer those two important questions. So before we get into the bioinformatics, let's talk a little bit about the ion torrent technology. It is truly a transformative technology, and the team at ion torrent has made unprecedented progress in the last couple of years, really going from a sequencing concept to a, a relatively mature sequencing technology. And that's because the ion torrent technology leverages uh, the semiconductor industry and leverages the cumulative investment that that industry has made over the last 30 years. The chips uh, that we produce for ion torrent are the same chips uh, that are produced uh, is, are, are produced in the same semiconductor factories that the chips uh, that exist in our iPhones uh, are produced. So let's, let's talk a little bit about uh, the technology. Uh, so instead of, uh, instead of sensing photons, uh, as is done in an image sensor, the ion chip senses protons. Uh, these hydrogen ions uh, that, that come off of uh, DNA as, as the uh, sequencing uh, is occurring. The cross-sectional view here uh, shows uh, the ion sensitive layer in green, the micro wells on top, and the transistor stack underneath. So then we pair this uh, scalable semiconductor technology with a very simple chemistry to arrive at a highly competitive sequencing solution. Uh, our simple natural chemistry eliminates a number of sources of error in light-based sequencing and provides us a number of advantages uh, minimizing read length limita limitations, uh, unnatural bases, slow cycle time uh, that, that results from this protect, uh, deprotect cycle. So that's the technology platform we're uh, leveraging. Uh, we've already made tremendous progress in sequencing cancer samples with ion torrent technology. Uh, if you're not already familiar uh, with uh, our ion AmpliSeq cancer panel, this uh, is a, a, a truly remarkable product. So this product is focused on measuring 46 cancer genes uh, and the key hotspots in each of these cancer genes covering important genes like EGFR and BRAF and KRAS. Only 10 nanograms of DNA uh, is required. Now a number of publications demonstrating that from limited formalin fixed paraffin embedded material, a small amount of DNA, uh, these key cancer mutations uh, can be read out readily and routinely. 
We've also launched a product called the Comprehensive Cancer Panel. This product seeks to probe 400 important cancer genes, uh, but now sequencing not just hotspots, but in fact all exons in these important cancer genes. An informatics product that we've recently launched, the Ion Reporter Oncomine Workflow, allows a scientist to rapidly run the hotspot panel or the comprehensive panel and layer on important annotations from the Oncomine database, uh, allowing the researcher to go very quickly from sample to sequence to meaningful uh, driver genetic variants in a cancer sample. The product concept that I'll be talking to you about today is uh, what we've uh, called the Oncomine Cancer Panel. The idea here is let's leverage a bioinformatics approach to survey all available genomic and clinical research data to arrive at the complete set of informative cancer drivers. So uh, we'll now begin to uh, assess not just mutations, but also key copy number events, as well as gene fusions. We're combining a DNA sequencing and RNA sequencing workflow to cover all three of these important genetic events. And our vision is a turnkey informatics and reporting solution to empower any clinical cancer researcher to go from cancer sample to informative driver genetic events and relevant clinical research related to those genetic events. So that's the vision, and today I'm going to tell you about the important bioinformatics work that we've done to move us closer to realizing that vision. So what we've done is <clears throat> taken a, a systematic data-driven approach to define the content uh, that, that we uh, desire to measure on the Oncomine Cancer Panel. So the, the two questions I alluded to earlier, what to measure and what to report. Actually, if you take a data-driven approach, it, it's the same data, the same knowledge that drives the what to, rep, uh, what to measure question, the content question, as, as, uh, as the uh, what to report question. So if we do this right, we can collect all of this important information and knowledge, and that tells us both. What do we need to measure from a mutations, copy number events, and gene fusions perspective, but then also, what are the important uh, pieces of information that we need to report out on the, rele on the relevance of these alterations? So I'm going to tell you about uh, our information, uh, informative driver genetic events knowledge base, and the information systems that we're building to keep this knowledge base up to date as new information becomes available to us in the public domain. This knowledge base really has two main components. The first uh, is the genetic drivers of cancer. So what genetic events can uh, take part in tumor genesis, in, in causing uh, a cancer cell or a cancer clone to emerge? Uh, and, and we're spanning, as I mentioned, three important classes of driver genetic events. But then also, what information exists in the public domain to link these driver genetic events to potential uh, treatments or clinical trials you know, really, let's, let's filter these driver genetic events down to those that are truly informative from a clinical research perspective. Uh, this information spans a number of sources. So which genetic events are on label for FDA-approved drugs? Which genetic events uh, show up in clinical guidelines? Which genetic events have early clinical research data suggesting that they link to a responder or a non-responder population? which genetic events are clinical trial enrollment criteria for uh, pharma clinical trials already today, and which have preclinical information or are simply targeted by either an approved drug or an emerging investigational drug, but don't yet have any evidence linking the drug to the genetic event. So our goal here is to assemble all available knowledge related to genetic driver uh, events as well as uh, information sources that can link genetic events to uh, potential therapies. So that's what we're aiming for in the talk. We're going to step through uh, each of these, uh, each of these areas, each of these uh, driver genetic event types, as well as each of these clinical information sources. Uh, and then at the end, we'll talk about how we put it all together to build a cancer sequencing solution, uh, really from uh, from the sequencing uh, kit all the way to uh, the informatic analysis. And, and ultimately uh, the reporting solution. So let's begin 
Uh, let's begin by uh, walking through the genetic drivers of cancer, starting with mutations. So to get a handle on the mutations that actually matter in cancer, the mutations that are actually uh, causal uh, in cancer, what we've tried to do is assemble all available cancer sequencing data. We're leveraging data sources such as the Cancer Genome Atlas, uh, which now uh, is up to about 5,000 cancer exomes, as well as published data uh, from, from the literature. Uh, we, we've identified about 30 or 40 additional studies, uh, bringing our total to uh, close to 10,000 published cancer exomes. And we've also incorporated data uh, from the important uh, cosmic database uh, as well. So let's talk about our approach with mutations. What we found upon surveying all of this mutation data and examining uh, the cancer genes that we know well and understand uh, is we, we found signatures, mutation signatures for both oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes. And, and to state it very simply, uh, the signature, the mutation signature for an oncogene is positive for hotspot mutations and negative for deleterious mutations. Now let me define those terms. So a hotspot mutation is any, any mutation that essentially piles up at a particular amino acid locus in the protein. So there are a number of these hotspot mutations that we all know well. In the BRAF protein, the V600E mutation is the most common mutation. That's a hotspot mutation. The KRAS G12 mutation uh, is, is a hotspot mutation as well. What we found is that <clears throat> When we survey known oncogenes, they all have this characteristic pattern, predominance of hotspot mutations and uh, uh, almost uh, non-occurring or rare deleterious mutations. So let me show you an example. We're looking here at the mutation signature for PI3 kinase alpha. In our database, we have observed 490 mutations in PI3 kinase. Uh, for a total mutation frequency of 16%. But the remarkable thing is that 85% of these mutations occur at hotspots. And we can see that here uh, in the lower panel. So as we look at uh, the uh, amino acid positions uh, for which we have observed PI3 kinase mutations, uh, we, we can see that these mutations certainly pile up at hotspots. So the most prominent hotspot, the H1047R mutation, more than 100 uh, cases with mutation at this site. The second most common hotspot, uh, the E545 mutation, again, more than 100 mutations. And then we can see a number of other less frequent hotspots, R88Q and 345K, E726K. So overall, 85% of PI3 kinase alpha mutations occurring at uh, one of these small number of hotspot mutations, the characteristic signature for an oncogene. So when we think about cancer sequencing, we actually don't need to measure the full PI3 kinase gene. We just need to focus on uh, these PI3 kinase hotspots. And the more cancers we sequence, the more resolution we gain on these true hotspot mutations. The interesting thing uh, from a drug development perspective is that these PI3 kinase mutations are not just occurring in the couple of cancer types in which they were originally identified. I uh, apologize for the coding here, but each of these bars, uh, each of these bars represents a different cancer type. So uterine cancer, breast cancer, cervical cancer. And what we found when we survey exomes systematically across thousands of tumors is that in fact, PI3K hotspot mutations coded in pink occur in nearly every cancer type tested. So it's not just the uterine cancers and breast cancers and cervical cancers that were, uh, that these PI3 kinase mutations were originally identified in. In fact, these PI3K hotspot mutations are occurring in stomach cancers, colon cancers, lung cancers, and even rarely in kidney cancers and prostate cancers. These same hotspot mutations occurring uh, repeatedly across a whole number of cancers. So this tells us, this data-driven systematic analysis tells us which mutations likely matter based on this characteristic signature, uh, this mutation signature for an oncogene. Now we've applied this bioinformatics approach to all of the exome data that I've described, and from that we've identified all of the genes that have 
recurrent hotspot mutations. And, and the wonderful thing is, is that this really covers all of the known oncogenes uh, known to be activated by uh, mutations in cancer, but this also identifies a number of novel potential oncogenes that have this characteristic hotspot pattern. So that's the oncogene mutation signature that we've observed and then used as a filter to search through all of the exome data to nominate cancer drivers that need to be measured by our uh, next-gen sequencing test. <clears throat> now let's talk about tumor suppressor genes. Tumor suppressor genes, when we examine their mutation signature, uh, tend to have a characteristic pattern uh, that is a combination of both hotspot mutations and deleterious mutations. Let me define deleterious mutation. Uh, in our analysis, we're defining deleterious mutations as those mutations that are either nonsense mutations resulting in a truncated protein or frame shift insertions and deletions. So, so uh, insertions and deletions that put the protein out of frame and, and basically uh, render it a, a non-functional protein. So those are two classes of mutations that we know are deleterious. Uh, there are also likely missense mutations that, that, that are deleterious, but that we can't be certain uh, based on uh, the classification. So the, the interesting thing is, is when we look at all of the known tumor suppressor genes mutated in cancer, so P53, CDKN2A, RB1, all of these genes have this characteristic pattern. A disproportionate fraction of their mutations are either hotspot mutations or deleterious mutations. I'm showing you here a gene, I would say a relatively recently discovered uh, tumor suppressor gene, ARID1A. This is a chromatin modifying gene. This is a gene that has this characteristic tumor suppressor mutation signature. So in this early analysis, we had 3,000 patients with uh, exome analysis, 6.9% uh, mutation frequency, uh, and 55.8% of those mutations clearly deleterious. This is entirely non-random, given that the background deleterious mutation rate is only on the order of 5 to 7%. So in a gene like ARID1A, when we see 55% of these mutations, as truncating mutations or frame shift mutations, we can be relatively sure that this is a selected for uh, mutational signature in ARID1A is, is a functional driver, uh, a, a tumor suppressor gene. Uh, the, the blue bars represent the proportion of uh, the mutations that are in fact deleterious in nature. Uh, and you can see that we're seeing deleterious mutations in ARID1A in uterine, bladder, stomach, cervical, colon, and a whole number uh, of cancers as well. So we believe that ARIN1A is a, uh, a driver tumor suppressor gene based on this systematic uh, mutation analysis. So those are two genes, PIK3CA and ARIN1A, that we all know well. Let me tell you about a gene that this approach uh, discovered, uh, a, a potential novel oncogene uh, in this case. So we all know BRAF and the BRAF E600E mutation. Uh, it's, it's been well targeted in melanoma by vemurafenib and other targeted therapies. Our analysis, un uh, our analysis uncovered another RAF family member, RAF1 or CRAF, that also has hotspot mutations. They're relatively rare, uh, but they do uh, tend to pile up at particular amino acid positions, suggesting that these RAF1 mutations are drivers as well. One of these hotspots, the S257L mutation, uh, we observed that mutation four times in our analysis, but the fact that uh, the mutations piled up at this one site uh, was non-random and that statistical significance. This hotspot mutation, though, we wouldn't have found if we looked at any one of these cancer types independently. We only identified this hotspot mutation. We put all of this data together and, and found that one stomach cancer patient, one uterine cancer patient, a colon cancer patient, a rectal cancer patient, and a lung cancer patient all had this same CRAF mutation, suggesting that this non-random pattern uh, is suggestive of a, a novel oncogenic driver in cancer. As it turns out, this S257L mutation has been observed in the germline and is associated with a, a syndrome called Noonan syndrome. Uh, it's been shown that this is a functionally activating mutation in the RAF1 gene. So what we're observing here is somatic mutation uh, in RAF1 at this hotspot. Uh, these mutations are mutually exclusive with KRAS and BRAF mutations in these diseases, further suggestive of that this is a novel oncogenic driver. So even though uh, 
pharmaceutical companies haven't begun directly targeting RAF1 mutations with, with therapies, these hotspot mutations are important to measure because they may turn out to be markers of response to RAF inhibitors uh, in the clinic. So, so this would be an example of a novel mutation that we've identified that we're going to include on our uh, cancer sequencing panel. Okay, so that's mutations. And, and that's our data-driven approach to use mutation signatures to really define the mutations that matter for our, uh, for our cancer sequencing panel. Let's now talk about copy number. So I think we all know that copy number events are almost equally important uh, in human cancer. There are a number of examples, the most notable being HER2 in breast and gastric cancer, where high-level focal amplification uh, of, of the HER2 oncoprotein leads to activated signaling and also leads to a uh, response to uh, drugs like uh, trastuzumab and pertuzumab. Uh, so the, the question is, what are the other driver genetic focal amplifications that occur in cancer? One approach would be to go to the literature and to try to survey the literature uh, for these uh, activated driver genetic events. Uh, but but uh, here we're taking a data-driven approach. We're really trying to look at systematic genome analysis to arrive at an unbiased list of driver genetic events, and we're doing the same thing uh, for copy number data. For copy number data, we can benefit from all of the work that was done on the microarray. So we uh, have amassed more than 25,000 microarrays assessing uh, DNA copy number, and we can use that data to ask what are the key focal driver amplifications in human cancer. To illustrate our analysis, I'm showing you uh, a gene that you may be familiar with, FGFR1. This is a gene that's been being targeted by a whole number of investigational agents uh, in the pharmaceutical industry. When we look at the profile, the copy number profile for FGFR1, uh, what we can see is that as we look across a whole number of cancer types, and in this view, more than 10,000 tumors uh, for which we've assessed FGFR1 copy number, we can see that most of the tumors have uh, somewhere around two copies of FGFR1, so the sort of normal diploid state. But some cancers, specifically in breast cancer, lung cancers, and ovarian cancers, have elevated FGFR1 copy number. Now the question is, are these FGFR1 DNA amplifications true cancer drivers, or are these cases where, for example, uh, the whole chromosome, the whole 8P chromosome arm is amplified and FGFR1 happens to be coming along for the ride. Uh, it, it's, it's really uh, our belief and I think what's, what's panned out in the literature that only if uh, a, a gene tends to be highly and focally amplified can we, can we really be certain that it's the true, uh, the true genetic driver in the region of genes that are amplified. So how can we get to that for a gene like FGFR1? So in this next slide, what I'm showing you uh, are, are, are uh, a drilled down view of the individual tumors uh, for which we have observed FGFR1 amplification and the boundaries of the amplifications that we've observed. So what we've got here are, uh, what we've got here are genes in the FGFR1 neighborhood. So here's uh, FGFR1 uh, right in the middle of this plot. Uh, we've got genes uh, ordered in chromosome order, uh, sort of upstream and downstream of FGFR1. And then uh, on the y-axis, we have the ovarian cancer patients that had FGFR1 amplification. Uh, in fact, we have 18 of 841 ovarian cancer patients with FGFR1 amplification. It's 2.1 percent. So each row uh, is one of these ovarian cancer tumors uh, that, that was measured by microarray and for which we, uh, we have collected uh, the data. And what you can see is some of these amplifications span, you know, a couple of dozen genes. Some of these amplifications, uh, like the one here in the middle, uh, include only three genes. And here's another one down a, a bit further, uh, an amplification that includes only two genes. So when we look at all this data and we attempt to summarize it uh, down below here now in the plot where we're uh, tallying up for each gene the number of cases with amplification in blue and the degree of those amplifications in pink, what we can see is that, in fact, there is a focal region here right around FGFR1 that represents the minimal common region of amplification. What that suggests is that FGFR1 and uh, maybe a neighbor or two 
uh, are likely the drivers of this amplification. Because in each of the tumors experiencing amplification in this region, that FGFR region uh, is always amplified. So that gives us good confidence that FGFR1 is indeed uh, a cancer driver uh, here in ovarian cancer. We can, uh, we can gain even more confidence by looking at gene expression data. So here now uh, on the x-axis, we've got copy number uh, of FGFR1 across the whole collection of tumors. And then on the y-axis, we have uh, expression. Importantly, we see that uh, we see that when FGFR1 is amplified, those cases also show overexpression of FGFR1. So this amplification is functional in the sense that it leads to elevated expression. Now there are other cases that also have uh, overexpression of FGFR1 that uh, do not have amplification. Uh, that, but that's not to say that these amplified cases leading to overexpression uh, are not drivers. So this gives us confidence that FGFR1 is an important driver, amplified gene uh, in human cancer, and thus we need to have this gene on our cancer panel. We need to be able to assess FGFR1. So we've done a similar analysis, uh, sort of genome-wide, examining all genes and examining their copy number profiles, the minimum common regions around amplifications and deletions, and co-amplification, co-expression pattern to arrive at what we believe are the, the, the true set uh, of, of driver genetic events uh, that are activated by DNA amplification. Okay, so that's mutations and that's copy number events. Uh, at the end, I'll summarize and tell you the number of genes we've identified in each of these buckets. But now let's first talk about gene fusions. So historically, gene fusions have been identified uh, with, with chromosomal techniques, karyotyping, uh, you know, that, how the Philadelphia chromosome, BCR able in chronic myelogenous leukemia, uh, was identified, uh, as well as a, a number of others. But just recently, really, uh, with the advent of RNA sequencing, have we been able to take a data-driven, data systematic, sort of transcriptome scale approach uh, toward gene fusion discovery? I'm going to tell you about the work we've done uh, in this space. Uh, so we're fortunate uh, from the Cancer Genome Atlas to have access to uh, now more than 5,000 uh, cancer transcriptomes. We also have uh, fantastic reference databases in Cosmic and Middleman, really surveying all of the historic literature on gene fusions. Uh, but it really is uh, this, this new RNA-seq uh, transcriptome data that allows us for the first time to survey tumors for uh, gene fusions that are likely important uh, genetic drivers in cancer. So let me tell you a little bit about our work uh, in gene fusions. So uh, as I mentioned, we've processed more than 5,000 transcriptomes to date. Uh, this is no small task. In fact, we have, we've had to build up a very loud, a large cloud grid computing infrastructure uh, to, to run through all, all, all of these samples. We've developed uh, state-of-the-art methods, really adapting uh, the methods that are out there in the public domain for our use. We've done very intensive training and testing to make sure that our algorithms can, can lead us towards true positive gene fusions while filtering out uh, the false positives. I'll, I'll show you, uh, we've, we've made, a, a, I think, a really important methodological, uh, methodological advance in layering in what we call exon expression imbalance analysis. Uh, and, and, and we've trained our method on uh, dozens of gold standard positive gene fusions that we know should exist in the population if our method is performing. Examples of those gold standard positives include PML RARA and RUNX1 in AML, uh, EML4 ELK and ROS1 fusions in lung adenocarcinoma, and then the S fusions genes in, in prostate cancers. So uh, what I'm depicting here uh, on the right in this bar chart is, is really our early training set of RNA-seq data, where we had access to a large amount of RNA-seq data. We knew which fusions we expected to find in this data, and then we could tune our algorithms to make sure that they were, in fact, finding these gold standards. So we've done that, but now we've turned the algorithms on uh, to these 5,000 transcriptomes and, and uh, really validated all of the gene fusions that we expected to find, but also have discovered a whole number of novel gene fusions, many of them, we believe, uh, will be informative uh, in clinical cancer research. So let's look at some data. So first here, I'm showing you uh, a, a few visualizations of the EML4 ELK gene fusions that we identify from systematic uh, bioinformatic analysis of RNA-seq data. 
So first, uh, in the top panel, uh, I'm showing you the exon representation of the fusions that we identified. So on the left, in green, uh, we've got the five prime partner EML4, and on the right, in pink, we have the three prime partner ELK, and what we're representing on the x-axis are the number of exons that participate in the resulting gene fusion. What we can see is that for these three gene fusions uh, observed in three independent uh, tumor samples, we can see that in all three cases, we've got the same exon structure for ELK, so 10 coding exons and, and uh, one, one or two non-coding exons, but we've got variable uh, exon structure for EML4. So two of the uh, gene fusions identified with uh, seven coding exons of EML4, the third with 13 coding exons. So this view gives us a sense for uh, the structure of these uh, gene fusions. And this is important when we are identifying novel gene fusions to ask the question, hey, are we seeing a consistent uh, exon structure uh, in the gene fusions uh, that leads us to believe that these are in fact bona fide driver uh, gene fusions? So that's sort of step one, calling the gene fusions based on reads that cross the gene fusion boundary, examining the exon structure. But the, the step two really is, is looking at the exon expression levels and asking the question, do the exon expression levels, are they consistent with gene fusions? So what I'd, what I'd like to do is draw your attention to uh, this panel here in the middle uh, where we're looking at ELK expression levels uh, across all of the exons in ELK. Each tumor sample is represented by a line the gene fusion positive cases by red lines, the gene fusion negative cases by blue lines. What we can see is, as we march across uh, the ELK transcript from five prime to three prime, we can see that uh, both for the fusion positive and the fusion negative cases, there's basically no expression of ELK. But in the fusion positive cases, we see a jump in expression in ELK right at the predicted breakpoint, which is designated uh, by the uh, red diamond. So we see this exon expression imbalance with increased expression post breakpoint relative to pre breakpoint. And, and we're only seeing that pattern in the fusion positive cases. This is basically confirmatory uh, analysis uh, using the same RNA seq data to predict the gene fusion, but also to validate the gene fusion by quantifying expression levels pre and post breakpoint. We think it's a very elegant method. Uh, it, it really is orthogonal data analysis, uh, but leveraging the same underlying RNA-seq data. So we've applied this method then across all of the available data. Uh, we, we, of, we of course find uh, all of the fusions in these tumors that, that we know and expect, but importantly, we've discovered a whole number of novel gene fusions in cancer. Uh, I'll give you one example. Uh, because it has such uh, important uh, clinical relevance, uh, you know, we discovered uh, uh, actually a handful of ELK gene fusions in colorectal cancer. Uh, these are, are just now beginning to be reported uh, in the literature. Uh, th this observation uh, we made a, a well over a, a year ago, a handful of novel ELK gene fusions in colon cancer, but also in about a half a dozen additional solid tumors. Uh, importantly, this PRK-AR1A ELK fusion uh, has the same uh, ELK exon, uh, exon structure as the EML4 ELK exons with 10 coding exons. And when we look at the exon expression data, uh, we get this same exon expression imbalance with a jump in expression, uh, with a jump in expression uh, post breakpoint uh, in, the, uh, in the fusion positive case uh, relative to the fusion negative cases. So our belief is that this is a bona fide novel ELK fusion, given that EML4 ELK fusions have been well targeted uh, in, in lung cancer, uh, it seems important that these additional ELK fusions uh, be measured uh, for clinical cancer research going forward. So that's gene fusions. Uh, now we've covered mutations, copy number alterations, and gene fusions, and we've built really the first half of the informative driver genetic events knowledge base, focusing on the driver genetic events. Now let's talk about uh, uh, the information sources we want to bring to bear to really get to which of these driver genetic events are informative from a uh, treatments and trials perspective. 
So a whole number of data sources that we've surveyed, compiled, and uh, analyzed. I'm just going to tell you about uh, some of the work that we've done on a couple of these data sources. When we talk about uh, when we talk about on label, uh, this is a pretty simple data source to curate. You know, we go to the FDA uh, website. Uh, and we can simply read what are all of the genetic events that show up on drug labels. These are, uh, of course, important genetic events to study. Uh, they're so important that they've, they've landed on a drug label. So that's one class. I'm not going to talk to you about that anymore. Similarly, with clinical guidelines, uh, we've, we've simply uh, surveyed the NCCN uh, and ASCO clinical guidelines and identified all the cases where one of our uh, genetic drivers of cancer shows up uh, in the clinical guidelines and documented all of those. What I will do is tell you about uh, some, some very exciting work we've done to summarize clinical trial results in the literature pertaining to uh, stratification by genetic events, but also clinical trial enrollment criteria. So if we look at clinical trials uh, that, that uh, pharmaceutical companies or academic investigators are sponsoring, uh, we, we can survey those clinical trials, look at the inclusion criteria sections, and identify a, a whole number of cases where genetic biomarkers are being used today as inclusion criteria for clinical trials. These then are, of course, important genetic biomarkers to measure on a cancer sequencing panel to get the most uh, out of a, a clinical cancer research study. Uh, in fact, you know, to summarize that data, we've identified more than 50 genetic events that show up in more than a thousand clinical trials uh, as, as inclusion criteria for nearly 300 targeted therapies. So uh, this is not just uh, you know, a small area of clinical research today. This is becoming uh, the norm. More than a thousand clinical trials covering 300 drugs using more than 50 genetic markers as inclusion criteria. So that's an important collection of data that we really need to have our arms around uh, in, in, an, in an updated manner such that we can understand which genetic events are important for clinical research. Uh, we'll also talk a little bit about uh, our, our efforts to compile preclinical information to identify informative markers and then also simply drug target databases. So first let's talk about uh, clinical trial results data mining as well as enrollment criteria. So what we've built is uh, really a semi-automated uh, data mining strategy. We're combining sort of the best of uh, natural language processing uh, to parse uh, clinical trial results and clinical trial enrollment criteria, but also uh, the, the, we, we're, we're layering in uh, expert data curation uh, by, uh, by PhD scientists. So what we found is that our, our automated data mining approaches can really get us to uh, the trials and the results sections that matter, but it really takes uh, a, a human eye, a trained human eye, to pull out those, those relevant facts. So let me show you an example. Here's an ASCO abstract uh, on a, a phase two clinical study of debrefinib uh, being tested in uh, BRAF mutant on small cell lung cancers. So what our uh, data mining approach does is goes and looks for keywords that are related to our driver genetic events of interest. So if you remember, you know, we talked about BRAF. So if we find the word BRAF in a clinical trial result, but then if we also find uh, keywords that might suggest uh, that there is a clinical trial result related to BRAF mutations, such as PR, SD, and PD, these are our standard uh, acronyms for uh, partial response, stable disease, progressive disease uh, as part of RESIST criteria, or, or uh, keywords like ORR, which stands for overall response rate, then we know we've found a relevant record. So, so the data mining uh, takes us to this record, but then our expert curator says, okay, we've got an interesting result here. In fact, uh, debrefinib was tested specifically in B600E mutant uh, lung cancers uh, treated with debrefinib, and a 54% overall response rate was observed. So this tells us both that BRAF is important to measure from a clinical research perspective, but also uh, if a clinical researcher is running our cancer panel, has a BRAF a result turn up in lung cancer, this is an important piece of research uh, to point that clinical researcher to, to understand the relevance of that finding. Okay, let's talk a little bit about uh, preclinical information. 
uh, there have been a whole number of really wonderful studies by, uh, by uh, the Sanger Center, the Broad Institute, studies published by uh, GSK, where large collections of human cancer cell lines have been probed with a whole number of uh, drugs, both investigational and FDA-approved drugs. Uh, and in parallel, these, these cell lines have been profiled by a whole number of uh, genomic profiling technologies. So what we've done is we've brought all of that data in and we've asked the question, which of our driver genetic events show up as uh, informative, predictive biomarkers in these preclinical uh, cell line models? So we've done this systematically across all of the data that's available. Let me show you an example. So here we're looking at uh, negative log IC50s on the y-axis. So uh, for uh, cell lines treated with a drug called pezopinib. Now pezopinib uh, was really marketed as a, a VEGF inhibitor, uh, but like many of these uh, receptor tyrosine kinase inhibitors, has off-target effects and, and blocks a, a number of uh, receptor tyrosine kinases. So what I'm showing you here are the negative log IC50s across a whole panel of a couple of hundred cell lines. Each cell line is a bar. What we see is that a small fraction of the cell lines, uh, a small fraction of the cell lines are uh, sensitive over here on the left, whereas the majority of the cell lines are resistant over here on the right. When we ask the question, do any of our driver genetic events associate with sensitivity, what we find is that FGFR2 amplified cell lines tend to be on the sensitive side. Now, there are only three of these cell lines colored in pink, but the fact that all three of these cell lines show up on the sensitive side of the distribution is highly statistically significant and suggests from this preclinical information uh, that FGFR2 amplification may be informative for the treatment uh, of uh, treatment with uh, FGFR inhibitors such as uh, pezopinib. Interestingly, uh, we, we, we recently saw a report from Matt Meyerson at the Broad that an FGFR2 amplified patient actually had, uh, had a tumor regression response uh, from treatment with pezopinib. Now, this is just a single case study, but uh, it, it, it substantiates to some degree this preclinical observation and, and really uh, this approach of using preclinical data to nominate potentially informative uh, cancer markers. I'll show you another example here. We're looking at the same type of a plot where we've got uh, cell lines, in this case, treated with a drug called trametinib. Trametinib is a MEK inhibitor from GlaxoSmithKline. We see that we've got uh, sensitive cell lines on the left, resistant cell lines on the right. When we ask the question, which of our genetic events uh, associate with sensitivity or resistance, we can see that NRAS muta mutated cell lines in pink tend to be sensitive no NRAS mutated cell lines on the resistance side. So again, a potentially informative genetic marker relevant for uh, a, a treatment like trametinib. In converse, when we look at uh, a PI3 kinase inhibitor, BES-235, this is an investigational agent, and we look at uh, its profile across cell lines, NRAS mutations tend to show up on the resistant end of the spectrum. So uh, again, NRAS may be an informative mutation for treatment with BES-235 and other PI3K inhibitors, but informative of the sense of uh, lack of response. Again, this is just preclinical information, uh, probably not something that, not, not, not data that would be used to make clinical decisions, but does tell us uh, about uh, markers that are potentially informative and important to measure on our cancer panel. So we've done an analysis just like this systematically across all of the uh, genetic events uh, and all of the, uh, this preclinical data that we've been able to accumulate uh, to arrive at what we believe are the informative genetic events from preclinical data. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about then the, uh, uh, the, the informative genetic events reference that we've built. So what I'm showing you here, this is a, an internal tool set, but really just a view on the knowledge base that we've created. And what we're doing here is we're surveying uh, one of our markers, ELK, and we're seeing that across uh, the uh, informative data sources that we've assembled, ELK shows up in a number of places. ELK shows up uh, in uh, clinical guidelines one time. Uh, there is one approved therapy, uh, crizotinib, that targets ELK. There are six investigational therapies 
that also target elk that are in various phases of clinical development. And there are 12 marker-based trials that are specifically enrolling patients with elk gene fusions, covering nine drugs. And those trials are summarized here down below. So by assembling all of this information, we both inform which markers we need to measure on our cancer panel, but also be, are beginning to accumulate the data that will be uh, interesting to our customers that are, uh, are engaged in clinical research and are measuring these markers uh, in, in their studies. So with that now, I've summarized for you our bioinformatics approach uh, to look for, to systematically define the genetic drivers of cancer, but also the, specifically those drivers that are informative for clinical research. When we combine drivers and uh, informative or actionable markers, we arrive at, interestingly, a relatively short list of genes. So about a uh, in, 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 together, about 130 genes, many of these genes show up both in the mutated and the copy number, the mutated and the gene fusions list, about 130 genes that we believe our data-driven approach suggests that there's evidence that they are genetic drivers of cancer, but also are in some regard uh, clinically, uh, are informative as, as it pertains to clinical research. So this is, th this is the content that we're now uh, beginning to uh, build out on the ion torrent platform uh, as the Oncomine uh, cancer panel. So you're getting a, a view into uh, our future direction. Uh, as we imagine this future product vision, uh, we imagine uh, an AmpliSeq kit for measuring DNA, another RNA seq kit for measuring RNA, focusing on the gene fusions and some important gene expression markers, sequencing uh, tumor samples uh, using both of these kits and the ION PGM or personal genome machine, uh, the ION 318 chip, we're, uh, we're building out now really a turnkey informatics workflow, uh, both to make variant calls, but also to layer on all of this important driver and uh, informative clinical research uh, data that we've accumulated so that our clinical research customers can very quickly understand the potential relevance of the variants coming off of this panel. So, so this is what we're building. We're very excited about it. We think, uh, we, we think this, uh, this product concept uh, has, has the ability to really allow a, a broad set of clinical cancer researchers uh, to survey the important driver genetic events uh, in human cancer. Just a couple of slides uh, before I wrap up to show uh, proof of concept. Uh, so we've got a number of studies now in the literature showing that we can very accurately detect uh, single nucleotide variants with ion torrents and AmpliSeq from formal and fixed paraffin embedded tissue with very small sample requirements down to 10 nanograms of DNA. What I'm showing you here is proof of concept data that actually ion AmpliSeq is also very good and very accurate for detecting DNA copy number level. And this is important, as we saw, because a whole number of, of genes are activated uh, by uh, amplification. What I'm showing you here is, is, is really that we're seeing a very uh, similar copy number profile when we look uh, using ion torrent analysis and we look uh, using array uh, CGH technology. Uh, this, this, this is just a, a, a glimmer of, of the early feasibility studies we've done, uh, but it shows you that we can accurately measure a copy number uh, by next-gen sequencing. And similarly, on the next slide, uh, this is work that we've done to show that we can accurately detect gene fusions by RNA-seq uh, using next-generation sequencing. What we have here uh, as rows are uh, a serial dilution of uh, a positive gene fusion, uh, an EML4 elk gene fusion from a lung adenocarcinoma cell line. Uh, we're diluting that down with normal RNA from human brain. Uh, across uh, the columns, we have a whole number of gene fusions for which we have primers that span uh, the potential gene fusion. One, in, one primer in the five prime gene, one primer in the three prime gene. And what we can see here is that this uh, particular cell line, which is positive for a, a single specific EML4 elk fusion, uh, our RNA-seq analysis by, uh, by uh, ion sequencing is only lighting up this, this one uh, gene fusion. Uh, and you can see we can detect that all the way down to a 1% a, a uh, one percent uh, dilution, and none of the other uh, gene fusions in the mix are lighting up. So what this shows is that uh, in a in a highly multiplex manner, we can detect uh, gene fusions uh, down to a very low 
uh, quantity uh, in the sample. So it's very exciting uh, that, that we can now measure accurately single nucleotide variants, copy number events, and gene fusions, really spanning all of the important driver genetic events uh, in cancer. Uh, for those of you engaged in uh, research, if you're interested in gaining access to some of the bioinformatics analysis uh, that we've done, uh, I would like to make you aware of a, a really fantastic product line that we've launched called the Oncomine Next Generation Sequencing Power Tools. Uh, these power tools uh, allow our users to, to drill into all of the exome and transcriptome data, the mutations, the gene fusions, the copy number event, to really understand the important driver genetic events in cancer. This tool set uh, is being used by uh, a whole number of large pharmaceutical companies engaged in drug discovery and development, but is also now be beginning, these tools are beginning to be used uh, by clinical cancer researchers in conjunction with uh, ion torrent sequencing to basically answer the question, you know, after you do sequencing and you get a whole number of variants that come out, which of those variants are likely to be driver genetic events that are worth following up on. So this tool set's available. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about the work that I described, the cancer panel uh, that, that we're developing, or these tools, I invite you to visit uh, our booth, uh, our online booth uh, in the meeting. So with that, let me conclude uh, and thank uh, all the teams involved. Uh, this, is, this has really been uh, a, a group effort across a number of divisions at Life Technologies. So our, our new medical sciences division, uh, the Compendia Bioscience team uh, in Ann Arbor, the Ion Torrent team, uh, as well as the Ambion team. We've really all come together to uh, assemble the best of life technologies in terms of sequencing, in terms of uh, DNA and RNA analysis, and in terms of bioinformatics. And, and our hope is that uh, we'll be able to uh, deliver to you uh, a very remarkable set of products uh, from these efforts. So uh, thank you for your uh, attention, and I'm happy uh, to take any questions. Michaeline, uh, let me turn it back over uh, to you. Thank you, Dan. Our first question is from Tiffany. What sensitivity in, in percent of reads do you use as a cutoff to say a given mutation is present in a sample? What is your cutoff for the total number of reads for each amplicon before you proceed with making a call? Oh, great question. Thank you for that. Uh, so uh, we're, we're looking at, we're, we're making calls in a couple of settings. So in, in the first setting, uh, we're really uh, looking at data we've accumulated from the research domain, uh, and, and we're, making, uh, we're making variant calls uh, from that data. In that case, uh, we tend to be a, a little less stringent because we're in discovery mode. But when we talk about, uh, when, when we talk about sequencing, uh, on the ion torrent for uh, clinical research use, uh, what, we're, what we're really targeting is uh, 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 analysis that get to at least 10%. We want to cover at least 10% uh, allele frequency. Uh, we're using a statistical model uh, basically to say, do we, have, do we statistically have uh, more variants observed in, in the tumor uh, than we would expect uh, by chance? But we're, but we're, we're targeting that 10% uh, allele frequency, uh, and we really need to see, you know, on the order of uh, five or 10 variant reads uh, to make a call and, and pass the statistical threshold. But, but in fact, uh, with the panel that we're developing, we're sequencing to such depth, you know, we're sequencing to uh, an average depth of, of 500x that uh, in most cases, when we're targeting that 10% allele frequency, we're seeing on the order of uh, 50 plus variant alleles, uh, even, in, even, even in that 10% uh, allele frequency scenario. Thank you, Dan. Our next question is from Moritz. Is the data on drugs and trials included in the Oncomine tools? Yeah, great question. The answer is not yet. Uh, we, we, we're really accumulating that data 
to guide uh, to guide the development of uh, the cancer panel, but it is our long-term vision to layer all of that information on drugs into the Oncomine tools and make those available to our research customers, uh, but, but not quite yet. Thank you. Our next question is from Anna. How much material from a biopsy is necessary for both DNA and RNA expression studies? Yeah, another good question. Uh, because we're using AmpliSeq, uh, we can get the uh, sample requirements down really quite low. Uh, 10 nanograms is the requirement on both sides for DNA and RNA. Uh, but, but please note for the RNA-seq studies that I've, de I've, de I've described, uh, we're really focusing on only a small number of gene expression markers and on uh, a, a large pool of uh, gene fusions, uh, but, but, but we know that really in most cases, you know, zero to one or two of those gene fusions are going to turn up positive. So, so the answer is uh, 10 nanograms, uh, and, and we think that's really one of the key differentiators uh, for the ion torrent and AmpliSeq platforms. Thank you. The next question is from Saravana. How do you validate the data mining results you get from preclinical studies? Yeah, great question. Uh, you know, it's, it's always tough uh, to validate a single preclinical result. Uh, you know, we really try to use multiple independent data sets to validate one another. So, for example, uh, in the FGFR result that I showed you, uh, I only showed you uh, the pizopinib data that showed that FGFR2 amplification associated with sensitivity to pizopinib, but we in fact had uh, a couple of other FGFR inhibitors that showed uh, that exact same pattern. So we try to use uh, independent preclinical data sets to validate one another. Uh, but the truth is, you know, uh, this, it, 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 the data sort of is what it is. It's, you know, it's early preclinical data. For us, it represents a hypothesis that suggests that a particular genetic event may be associated, may be informative, uh, an informative biomarker, but we really won't know that uh, until we can begin to collect clinical data uh, in, in larger uh, clinical studies. But, but that early hypothesis for us is good enough to say that that's an important marker, uh, it, it needs to be measured on the panel, and, and that early uh, preclinical data uh, may be uh, informative and interesting uh, to a clinical researcher as, as, as they're uh, getting uh, clinical sequencing results. The next question is, when, is from Wafa. What is the difference between ion torrent and the other sequences, sequencers used? Yeah, I think that's a great question. You know, there are, are, are certainly other sequencers on the market. Uh, we believe that Ion Torrent has uh, ultimately superior uh, technology for uh, sequencing DNA, uh, leading to uh, lower error rates in, uh, for detecting single nucleotide variants. Also, I think, you know, sort of if I had to, if I had to put my finger on key differentiator for the application that I'm describing, uh, that I've described today, uh, there really are two. It's sample input. Uh, so the fact that we can get down to uh, 10 nanograms of DNA uh, from formalin fixed paraffin embedded tissue, but and then also uh, turnaround time. You know, we can complete the entire workflow really from, sam uh, from, from sample in to analyze sample uh, in less than a day, and that just can't be done uh, uh, on, on other sequencing platforms. Thank you, Dan. I believe we have time for just one more question. That question is from Adam. Do you think these genetic drivers will have diagnostic usage in the future? Yeah, great question. Uh, you know, that, that's, that's our view. That, that ultimately these genetic drivers will, will, will become uh, important diagnostic markers. If you look at the important diagnostic markers today, 
So BRAF, VGFR, KRAS, EML4 ELK, all of these uh, markers uh, represent genetic drivers of cancer. And, and because they represent distinct mechanisms and pathways to activate cancer, uh, you know, logically, they're leading to differential response to targeted therapies. So it's our view that as uh, the pharmaceutical industry attempts to target more and more of these genetic drivers of cancer, these genetic drivers then become important uh, diagnostic markers. So today, many of these markers are, are really only important for clinical research, but ultimately we believe as, as the therapies, uh, as the investigational therapies progress towards approval, many of these markers become uh, important uh, diagnostic markers as well. I'd like to thank everybody uh, for uh, their attention. Thank you for the questions. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Uh, I hope this was useful uh, to you. Thanks. I'm going to turn it back over to you, Michaeline. Back over to you, Mike. Thank you. And at this point, we'll go ahead and conclude this session and thank all the participants.